Thank you for tuning in once again to God's Demons and Magic. This is your host, Sri Sachinandan Das. We've been discussing over the last few episodes the worldview of the ancients. They saw the world as a place that was filled with all sorts of subtle entities. Every aspect of nature was due to the presence, ultimately, of some subtle being or some god. And in ancient Egypt, in, in the Hellenistic world, these subtle beings were given the name daemons. Their understanding was that everything that you encounter in life, you're essentially participating in the influence within the universe of a particular daemon. There are good daemons and there are bad daemons. The good daemons are those that lead you upward through knowledge. And they give you a kind of inner inspiration which allows you, when you follow it, to live more in harmony with the gods and the very structure and purpose of the universe and to live more in harmony with your fate and essentially to become purified and move towards liberation from this material existence entirely. What would be termed the bad daemons, they're not necessarily evil, rather they are a lower classification of daemon or spirit being that control aspects of nature which degrade us or deprive of us of knowledge, which lead us into darkness. And so the soul is seen as standing at a kind of a crossroads between these influences, these subtle entities. Some of the entities pull one upwards and some of them drag one down. If you choose to meditate on lower qualities such as lust or anger or greed, then what you're doing is you're meditating on that aspect of the universe which is predominated and controlled by a lower form of demonic or subtle energy. Say, for example, you're an Egyptian priest or some sort of spiritual aspirant, and you may find yourself at times struggling with lust, you know, intense sexual desire, which is uh, it's outside the bounds of religion. Maybe you're a married man or woman and you're attracted to someone who's not your husband or wife. So whereas in the modern context, an individual, you know, religious person experiencing that will understand that this is lust and I have to strive against it. I don't want to surrender to this. But they don't necessarily see it as the influence of some sort of daemon or being. Whereas what the ancients saw was, you know, when I feel my mind and senses being filled with these desires and I feel myself being sort of dragged down into this lower path of life, this destructive path of life, this path which is uh, a kind of darkness covering my spiritual truth, my spiritual knowledge, and, and sort of confining my consciousness into lower impulses, the, the, the ancients would see this as I'm actually tuning into or participating in the energy of a particular daemon. So with your consciousness, you can tune into different aspects of nature, very much like you would tune into different radio stations in a car or something like that, either by turning the knob or pushing a button. You can home in on and grasp on a certain frequency, a strong frequency. So similarly, by your consciousness, you can latch on to the, the energy within this world of a particular daemon. That may be the energy of lust. It may be the energy of anger or greed and or depression. And in this way, you're filling your consciousness with the influence of that particular being. And that being is ultimately a person. And with the lower daemons, you know, prolonged exposure is a corrupting influence. It's just like, for example, if you are driving in your car back and forth to work, and then you start to listen to a certain talk radio station. Maybe they're talking about politics and they're very angry and they're very forceful and they're using a very harsh language, extremely critical, uh, disproportionate, illogical, whatever it may be. There, But you become influenced by that emotion and you also become angry. You know, and you also begin to take on the qualities of that person that you're listening to and they, their view of the world begins to predominate your own. So in the same way, it's like the, just as that, that radio personality is powerful. There's a celebrity figure, they have strong opinions, they're very good at vocalizing them. And, and by that power, you, you essentially, they're able to sort of overcome you and condition you with their way of thinking and their, uh, their way of, of interacting with the world. So in the same way, the daemons are powerful beings, and the more that you listen to them, or the more that you tune into their particular energy, they sort of envelop you, and and you become conditioned to be more like them. So if you have a, a sort of like, as a soul, you have a freedom of choice, 
and you can choose how which station you want to tune into. And just like if you're sitting in your car, you have a choice who you're going to listen to. This mystical religious tradition then advises you to listen to the good daemons, to tune into their frequency, and to become sort of conditioned by their uh, association. And their good association leads you upwards. Now, I live in California. Oftentimes, I drive to the Central Valley, and uh, there's a lot of Christian religious programming on the radio, and I'll listen to it. And uh, and so you, know, you hear these Christian preachers are giving their particular perspective on the world, and, and it's very nice. But if you can imagine, what if you actually went to one of their churches, and you actually knew them personally, and they were invested in your life? Like they, they were individuals that you didn't just meet on Sunday, but you actually, they're, they're almost like family. Like they come over and say hello, and, and you've known them for 20, 30 years, or in fact, you've known them your entire life. Say, for example, you had a, a preacher or a priest who's really been there since your birth and has taken an interest in you since you were a small child and knows your parents, knows your grandparents, and is really someone who is very closely and intimately tied to your life. So in the same way, there's the frequency of the personal daemon. You know, there's a there's a daemon which has been assigned to you at birth, and that particular daemon is very much tied to your life and tied to the fate that you experience within this world. And so you might say it's, it's quite easy to then go into their divine association and be uplifted by them because you have such a personal connection to them. And so the general understanding is that the universe is filled with these subtle entities. Some uplift you and some degrade you. Now, the ones that degrade you, they're not necessarily evil or bad or even antagonistic to the sort of hierarchy of, of creation of, of the gods and of God. Rather, they are, in a sense, out of harmony. But they're understood to be a valid part of creation. It's, it's understood that God has created light and dark. And the reason is because you have freedom to choose which side you want to cultivate. Because the soul, in a sense, has the desire to degrade himself into darkness. Therefore, there's an opportunity within creation to do that. Just as there's an opportunity to go upwards towards the light. And this is a widespread concept throughout Egypt and Greece and the Middle East. This worldview is greatly altered by the coming of Zoroastrianism. No longer are the good and bad daemons passive forces, that the soul is free to choose you know, how he wants to cultivate his consciousness and their association. But now the soul is trapped within the midst of a cosmic warfare. The bad daemons become evil. They become demons. And the good daemons become angels. And it's a, a zero-sum game. The soul really has to choose. Do you want to take God's side, or do you want to take the side of evil? And so there's this very black-and-white approach to morality. And Zoroaster himself was an extraordinary personality. And much like Jesus Christ, not much was known about him in the years between his childhood and between when he started his preaching of his religious movement around the age of 30. Both Greek and Iranian traditions, they say that during that time he was absorbed in the performance of penance and study. In fact, some of the Greek traditions say that he was living in forest instructed by Brahmanas or Indian Brahmanas and sages. It's very similar to the, the whole um, Jesus in India theory, right? Like Jesus had traveled into India along with the trade routes and was influenced by their philosophies. So in the same way, the Greeks actually believed this about Zoroaster, that he had traveled into India and was living there as a yogi or a sage. The ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, he mentions the enlightenment of Zoroaster. The Zoroaster, you know, as mentioned, he was in meditation, he was performing his austerities in seclusion, and then he had the revelation of a, a being of light came to him, and that, that good spirit was known as successful thought in ancient Greek. That was the name given to him. And Diodorus Siculus actually says that this, this divine being of light which came to Zoroaster was a good daemon. And this divine being of light gave Zoroaster all of his laws and the whole philosophy and religion of Zoroastrianism. What's interesting is that within Zoroastrianism, this divine spirit 
or Amesha Spenta, this holy immortal that had come to Zoroaster. His name is Vohumana, which translates as good thoughts. So you see this this very close connection between what this ancient Greek historian is writing and what the Zoroastrians themselves believe. So he had obviously a very good source. And the Zoroastrians believe that this Vohumana, this, this powerful spirit of light, is not necessarily a daemon, uh, but a an actual manifestation of God, similar to the the idea of the Holy Spirit within Christianity. They believe that Ahura Mazda, who's the one supreme, beneficent, transcendent God, uh, he manifests himself into the world in different expansions or uh, of his energy, of his power, of his qualities. And so one of those is Vohumana. And Ahura Mazda and his divine expansions or manifestations in the world are directly opposed to a being of evil known as Ahiram or Angra Mainyu. And Angra Mainyu also has manifestations, six of them in the world, which are his own power and qualities. And they're manifestations of great evil and destruction and, and de- devastation and degradation. And so the world is seen as a kind of battlefield where these manifestations of God are trying to bring the forces of good into the world. And then from the other side, you have this great manifestation of evil trying to degrade and destroy the world and pollute the creation. And the Zoroastrian, he is in the midst of this, and he has to actually choose to surrender to the forces of Ahura Mazda by practicing a lifestyle of good words, good thought, and good actions. And so all the entities within this world, whether they be human beings or they be subtle beings or daemons, they really fall into two camps. Those who are inherently evil and submitted to the power of evil within the world, which seeks to pollute the world, or those who are in the camp of Ahura Mazda, the good god. And then within the Zoroastrian world, the Magi, they were most of what their magical rituals were directed towards was somehow either placating or negating the influence of these evil demons within the world. They would see themselves as forces of good, those those souls who are surrendered to Ahura Mazda, and they're fighting against these evil demons within the world and trying to control them through magical rituals. These bad demons or these evil subtle beings which permeate nature and are in all aspects of creation they're considered the source of the sufferings within human life. Whether it be famine or disease, it's actually caused by the influence of these negative entities. And within Hermetic and Egyptian astrological traditions, you'll see that the 11th house within a chart is considered the house of the good daemon, and the 12th house of the chart is considered the house of the bad daemon. And the 11th house is a place of where, where wonderful things happen to you, where good things happen to you. Even if there's negative influences within the 11th house, they become better due to the beneficent nature of the 11th house. So it's really a place of blessings, and it represents the blessings of the good demons, the, the angels, you might say, the, the higher beings, which are filling your life with happiness and pleasure, satisfaction, and even those negative things in life, making them better. Whereas the 12th house represents... Uh, the things that you lose in life, the destructions within life, the suffering you experience, as well as your own negative propensities. Just as, you know, you might say you're tuning into that negative daemon and developing its its disharmonious nature within yourself. So the twelfth house will show what your propen- where you have the propensity to do that, where you have the propensity to become degraded. And so, you know, it'll show those things in life where you suffer because you degrade yourself and you have a a lower propensity. And so there's a very clear idea in the ancient world that the good demons are giving you the happiness in life and the bad demons are the source of suffering and misery, misery and tragedy. And it's interesting because within Zoroastrianism, this sort of cosmic battle between these forces, it ends in the, you know, with the total destruction and renovation of the world, a great end-time battle where all of the dead are resurrected into immortal existence and all of the evil demons within the world are driven out. So whereas the the Hermetic and Egyptian traditions are really, it's seen as a process of 
moving through layers of consciousness, raising yourself uh, to higher and higher levels until you actually transcend the world or lead the world completely. These, the Zoroastrian tradition was one of the evil being purged from the world and the world itself being a, becoming a kind of utopia. So because the evil demons or the bad demons are defeated, there is no more famine, there is no more disease, there's no more suffering, essentially. And the world becomes one predominated only by the good demons and filled with the power, the glory of Ahura Mazda. And you see also extreme traditions of dualism between good and evil arising within the Eastern Mediterranean with philosophies like Gnosticism. And some branches of Gnosticism saw you know, that there's a one supreme transcendent beneficent God who's good, and then the world itself in totality is evil. And all of the daemons within the world are bad daemons. And even the gods or the planet, which are traditionally considered the planets, they're also evil. And then the one creator God, who is sort of like the greatest of the daemons, he himself, the Demi-Urge, is the, the, the greatest of the bad daemons. He's actually evil. And the world has been constructed to cause suffering and misery to all of those within it. And we're placed within this world, which is a kind of prison house, because we're rebellious against God. And the, the planets themselves are almost like prison guards. They're, they're considered evil, uh, demonic, and they're trying to actually hold you down. And they're really covering your consciousness in layers of their influence. So in order to transcend and escape the prison house. You have to surrender to God, but you have to pass through the different spheres of the planets. Just kind of like in the Platonic uh, cosmology, you have the the planets themselves are embedded in spheres, like a, like a marble embedded in a, a glass orb. And then within one orb is another and another and another. And then the Earth is kind of at the center of these uh, consecutive spheres. And so, you know, the the... The, the planets themselves are sort of binding you with their power. And so you have to transcend the sphere of Mercury. You have to overcome the, the influence of that demon known as Mercury. And then you have to transcend next, you know, the layer of Venus. And you have to overcome the influences of Venus upon your life and in your consciousness. And then you have to overcome the influence of Mars and strive above the different struggles and difficulties caused by the influence of that daemon. So in a sense, you're moving through the various walls of the prison house until finally you come to the final layer, the final sphere. And when you transcend that, then you enter into the abode of God and reach perfection. But the entire universe, this, this spherical prison house, is really meant for your punishment and rectification of your rebellious spirit. And not all of the systems of Gnosticism were quite that extreme. Some of them acknowledged that there were good demons or good spirits within the world, uh, hierarchies of archangels and angels that are, you know, in conflict with hierarchies of demons. But even they are considered to be rebellious spirits. They're also prisoners, but they're just prisoners of a higher class. Just like in a prison house, you have, you know, cell block D or cell block A, and uh, maybe A is not so bad. You know, they get to go outside or whatever. You know, they get to pick garbage in the forest or, you know, they have some some nice experience of prison life. But still, they're bound with, within the same prison, ultimately. So similarly, their idea was that the angels and archangels, they're rebellious souls just like the rest of us. But uh, they're of a higher character, higher level of consciousness. Um but ultimately, just like we do, they must also surrender and then pass through the various walls of the prison house. And so we see that over time, different philosophies arose with a, a radically different idea about the universe. The universe itself being populated by practically unlimited subtle entities, demons or spirits, supernatural influences, and the universe is composed of these influences. And we ourselves are in the midst of these influences with the ability to choose how we want to move. It becomes a world torn apart where the universe itself is a, a battlefield of cosmic forces, essentially fighting over rebelliousness or submission to God. And those forces which are good and benevolent and which uplift one's consciousness 
and which bring the good things and the happy things to one in life, they become angels. And those forces which degrade one's consciousness and by which or through which one suffers the, the miseries of existence, then those become evil and they become demons. So thank you very much for listening. If you found value in this, please like and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, please visit com backslash iTunes and leave a positive review. Thank you again, and we hope that you'll join us next time on Gods, Demons, and Magic. Thank you.